Welcome to episode 14 of Capital Workspaces Presents The Hub podcast. My name is Andrew Birchins. I'm the audio engineer here at The Hub. I thought I'd start off this week's episode by highlighting a portion of our conversation with our guest, Scott Cedar. Scott is a local artist, actor, teacher, whose work has been featured everywhere from the pages of the Washington Post to the hallways here at Capital Workspaces. Here's a brief clip from our interview with Scott Cedar. I have a painting of nurses with a child and uh, some of the things in my studio or in my shows are related to this. Okay. Um, but es- essentially nurses became my family for a time because I was isolated and taken away from my mother and father. And my mother had this terrible time of not being able to visit me. She's looking at me through a, a glass door at the end of the hallway. You know, oh, and that's pretty hard. Yeah. Now here's our interview with Scott Cedar. Good morning, everyone. This is our first morning podcast. Yeah, this is great. So good morning. Thank you for visiting us once again at The Hub Podcast that is presented by Capital Workspaces. My guest today is Scott Cedar. Scott is an artist. He paints in oil, tempura, and watercolor to create art that shares many of the qualities of neo realism. Now, his 60 year career has its origin in his childhood use of art making as a way to convalesce and cope with the damaging effects of the polio virus. Good morning, Scott. How are you? Good morning, Michelle. (laughs) I'm wiping the sleep from my eyes so that I can have a conversation. (laughs) Great. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. So, um, over 60 years. Yes. And do I I look kind of creaky here? Like no, <laughs> no, as I told you, just the wisdom. And thank you so much for being our guest. Now, it says that you started painting as a young child. I did. Um, I was encouraged by some of my teachers. And uh, fortunately, they managed to get my work into a downtown department store in Denver, which I, I was very proud of. Very interesting. A couple of um, paintings of wildlife, insects and ducks, and uh, big, big pieces on paper, which I enjoyed. And Every now and then I will go back to that style because it kind of frees you up and lets you be a child again when you're working. Awesome. I would like to share also a statement that I read of yours. It said that you find connections between the conceptual aspects of your life and its finer details. You begin to follow patterns as you recognize them. And it also says that you're attracted to things that have a temporary quality. Children, they grow older. Flowers, the fragile act of sleep, the precarious nature of good health. You says frequently when you incorporate work from your sketchbooks to create composite images within your paintings. Now, can you discuss neorealism? What is that? Right. Essentially, it's a, a new version of realistic painting. Okay. But it implies a kind of, uh, obviously, a new take on it or some variation on the, um, instead of seeing a cabin in the woods, you might see some variation in the lighting Okay. Or some kind of, perhaps in my instance, the addition of some kind of abstraction or a pattern, as I like to play with. Okay. And that colors it in a way, not just in terms of red, blue, and green, but in terms of the feel. Okay. Uh, Leonardo used to talk, there was, he was called, uh, he had a, he introduced a, t- a technique called fumo, which is smoke, essentially. Okay. So the backgrounds look like they're very misty. Oh. And... I play with squares and the pattern of squares to add some kind of quality that makes it less, it, it's softer. So the realism is softer. I heard, I read where it, pixels yes. is what it's described as. And That's me, a way to talk about it. Gotcha. I understand. It kind of make the uh, parallel of when I think of pix- pixels, I'm thinking technology. Sure. <laughs> but if you notice, the most people are familiar with digital images and they are created by pixels, especially in television. Yes. And those are little squares of color or okay. light. I just happen to use those on a larger scale. So it adds a kind of um, screen over things, if you will. Very interesting. It also, you're also a graduate of Loyola University of Maryland. Correct. You're from Denver, Colorado. So also University of Denver and a performer, actor, teaching artist as well. So out of 
acting, you said that you started acting in college or painting. Which is your most loved, I guess, medium of expression? Mm. Well, that's awfully hard to put your finger on. <clears throat> I'd like to say that the art that I do in my studio, I can do by myself, and I don't have to get cast to okay. do it. Okay. So uh, I do love to perform. I don't have as many opportunities as some people. Not yet. Not every. Well, let's be realistic. There are not that many. There are now more opportunities for someone who uses leg braces and things than there were before. Okay. People are more open to the idea of seeing that on stage, whereas before, not so much. Really? Very mm -hmm. interesting. And, and that's a segue into discussing polio. It was discovered that you had polio at the age of two. two. I was uh, just slightly before the polio vaccine, which was in 1956. So in 1952, there was a very big epidemic here in the, the United States. Yes. Um, and many children were confined to uh, iron lungs. It, it was considered a childhood disease, although adults can get it. Um, <clears throat> for, it's a. It was not well understood, and as like many viruses, yes. uh, still a little bit of a mystery. But uh, a doctor did some autopsies of polio victims at that time and found out that the polio virus is very specific to um, attacking part of the brain stem, which. I was told, well, your right leg has been affected or your part of my, you can see my neck is slightly okay. different than those muscles. Okay. And um, so I always talked about polio in my leg, but the fact of the matter is it attacked the central nervous system. Okay. And I see that you're with the past president of the Polio Society of Washington, D.C. What did that role entail? And I would, would like to discuss um, your emotions towards dealing with polo for the majority of your life. But the Polo Society, what does it do? Well, many people began, this is, this is a, let's make a few generalizations, but uh, I okay. think they're fairly accurate. Uh, I was told as a child, once I was able to walk again, that I could do absolutely anything. Okay. And I certainly tried to do that, including climbing, climbing some mountains and Colorado and in Alaska. Beautiful. Not gigantic mountains, but sufficient enough to make it kind of interesting. And uh, around 40 years after my, um, my bout with polio, I began to have some problems. I started falling downstairs. Oh, my gosh. Um, and that was, you know, I was still, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't the old man you see in front of you. So this was some concern. And this is something called post-polio, or at least... Um, uh, it has been described as um, the cells that were destroyed or damaged in the body uh, that create the the um, energy for muscles to react. Um, they are hmm, some cells died, so other cells took over their place, and in that adaptation, after forty years of working more than double time on their their work, they become a little tired or a little less active. Okay. As a consequence, many people found themselves very, very tired, very much less able to do things that they thought they could do. Uh, it was a, a agreed among some scientists to call it post-polio syndrome. And the Polio Society was really established to um, deal with that as opposed to polio itself because uh, – the fact of the matter is, after the success of the polio virus, some doctors just were not even taught what the what the symptoms of polio were, or did not have any any concept of how really? to deal with us. So, as a consequence, uh, a groups groups of um, polio survivors around the country organized and said, "Look, we've got to have some follow up, some care here." So, yeah. and we ended up teaching doctors coming into our um, medical appointments with some information that helped them understand us a little better. That's amazing. And that's really what the Polio Society was about. Thank you for that. I think that, um, of course, in the present age of the coronavirus, where that's something new, and I, I really pray that they don't stop studying it, um, the effects of it, and because it's you know, because it's so new, you, you don't know what side effects and um, 
different stages, and then they said it had different strains of it. So um, thank you for that aspect of it. So uh, you mentioned that in your work in film and acting that I guess we've had this perception of when we watch movies, um, any kind of visual media, we want to see something kind of perfection. And you're sharing that people are grown to be more comfortable with seeing someone on crutches. Yes, and I think um, storytelling is essentially what we're up to, right? We're telling stories. And yes. so you want to see the story. You want to have the hero be the hero and have him be able to do pra practically everything he could possibly do. Well, um, these days, even in the instances of um, um, shows that m might not normally be considered... Uh, open to the possibility of someone with a disability, we're being asked to try to fill those shoes. Uh, it's not often, but it's it's a new. For instance, there was a young woman in the uh, most recent production of Oklahoma on on Broadway who was in a wheelchair, and you wow. don't see that. You know, you don't see a person dancing around in a wheelchair or singing. Yeah, and in fact, that's a possibility because there are performers out there who are. Disabled in various different ways. Oh. I had a lovely friend here in Washington who was uh, uh, a Down syndrome child and uh, very sharp and a very good actor and uh, quite fun and very good at what he did. Awesome. More inclusivity. Yes. I, um, I think about the show that I actually loved with Michael J. Fox with Parkinson's disease. He had his own Indeed. sitcom in the era of when Parkinson's uh, uh, taken over his middle-aged life, and they canceled it. I'm not sure what the reviews were, but I loved it because I've loved him as a, um, a a child actor as well. So that was one of my um, favorite shows that got canceled. I'm just like, why? And I hope that that wasn't the reason. It could have been his acting or time. Mm -hmm. But I think that right now we are in an era of like getting rid of the white whitewashed perfection, everything has to be perfect in our faces with the, you know, social media and technology. More people are now feeling, I guess, accepted for who they are. So I, I thank you for sharing that. May I ask, um, family, children? I am married. Yay. I have uh I've had pets almost all my life. No <laughs> okay. children we tried, but so uh, that wasn't good in that wasn't in the cards for us. Okay. My wife is also a performer and writer, and um, both of us have been been able to work with children, and that was our way of having them. Wonderful. Um, both of us have worked with many different students of various ages. Wonderful. So she's a, a writer of books or playwright? She, write lyric. she, she writes plays, and she's also uh, she's a critic, and she's written uh, lyrics. Often she writes, her favorite thing to do is to take one of Mozart's, Mozart's operas and set it in the Wild West, let's say. No. Yeah. <laughs> Really, no, quite are you fun. There's, there's an opera <laughs> I called. I love art. There's an opera called uh, um, "The Abduction from the Seraglio," and it's, uh, of course, in German. It's something else. But um, Mozart was telling the story of um, the pirates in the Mediterranean who used to make money um, by capturing or uh, kidnapping someone. And in this instance, there's a pasha, a very wealthy. Um, ruler who says I'm yeah I want I want to have this young woman and uh, I'm going to make her love me and of course she doesn't necessarily love him <laughs> okay and uh in my in my wife's instance she took that story and had seen uh, a wonderful film called The Westerner with Gary Cooper and uh Walter Brennan these are older actors many many years ago yeah and uh she said, you know, it would be kind of interesting to put that story in the Wild West. Okay. With Judge Roy, Roy Bean and Lily Langtree. So in this instance, the Pasha turned into Judge Roy Bean, who was a Texas lawman, and Lily Langtree, who was an actress from the, that era. Okay. And uh, suddenly we have a story that's still telling the beautiful music or told through the beautiful music of Mozart. But That with, is so very words. interesting. I love the creativity of anyone who deals in any kind of um, medium of art, how they can take a story and a story that's been told many times and flip it on its head and put in a different um, time period or it's Wild West, oh my God, uh, or a different geograph geographical location and give a new meaning to it. So um, how long have you been married? 
since 1985. Oh, wonderful. So quite a long time. What? Okay, go I'll ahead. i just throw something else out here. Yes. Right now you see me with a mustache. Often yes. I have a beard. This mustache is for a show that takes place in West Texas in the 1930s at First Stage Tyson's where we're doing The Rainmaker, which is an old play. Okay. An old film, but we're doing it with a new twist because we have a cast that includes me. Yay! Among others. And uh, normally this cast does not include um, people of color, but we have several of them. Okay. So um, there's another example of our our current age trying different things. With- yeah, broadening the horizons and, and being inclusive. So... Um, the Rainmaker. What is the story behind the Rainmaker, if you don't mind? Well, the Rainmaker um, references uh, this takes place kind of in the Dust Bowl and in the time of a drought in okay. Texas. And often people are duped by people who come and say, "Well, you know, I can make rain." Oh gosh, yeah. And uh, snake so, oil salesman. But really, the story is about a young woman who's. Um, through her early life, has been consi- considers herself plain, and uh, that might mean any sorts of things. But essentially, uh, she's about of the age when she feels that she will never be able to marry. Okay. And uh, when the rainmaker comes, well, things things happen differently. Okay. All right. I won't tell you much more. No, I know. You want to just give a little bit of a teaser. That's right. So we can run. So when, what days and what times will it be airing? It opens in uh, this month, November. Let's see. I haven't wrote that down here. November 17th and runs through the December 11th. Firststage.org is. Mm Firststage.org is where you can find Scott Cedar. Well, you can find the play. Find the play. Okay. And how did you just come in contact with Capital Workspaces? Because here we um, focus on making the podcast studio, Capital Workspaces, the co-working space for entrepreneurs, artists, and businesses. We try to make it available to some. So how did you come in contact with Mark here at Capital Workspaces? Patricia Dubroff is uh, part of the the team here. She's a, a woman who uh, organizes the art shows in this in this building. And I had met her uh, in another capacity. We were, um, uh, several of my friends and I were performing and re- doing readings of plays at the Iona House, which is a senior services uh, uh, building and a uh, um, service so associated with uh, St. Columbus Episcopal Church. Um, we had a friendship, and uh, she asked me a couple of questions. So one day she said, instead of being an actor, she said, I think you're, uh, didn't I hear that you're a visual artist as well? Yes, I am. Well, well, so what I'd like to see your work, because I sometimes put art here in, in oh, Iona yes. House. Well, uh, this was just prior to the pandemic, and she said, I'll schedule, a, schedule you for 2021. Uh, of course, things happened, and uh, <laughs> also she was let go at um, oh, because sorry. of well, budgets changed. And yeah, of course. Life life has gone yes. in many many directions for people, and uh, and yet she said, "I still want to have you get you know I, I I'm hoping I get you somewhere somehow." So when she started working with Mark, uh, she had done a couple of shows before, and she said suddenly, "Well, you know, would you be interested in this?" and so we had a conversation and we talked again about trying how to make this work. And here I am with a show that's going to last a year, which is pretty Ooh, exciting. That is wonderful. Mm-hmm. And for an artist, Indeed. that is exciting because I think the heart of an artist and myself as well and Andrew being an engineer, we just want to, the expressions that's inside of us, we just want it to be seen, to be heard, to be experienced. So um, for congratulations oh, thank you. to you. Thank you. A question about just the, the topic of viruses, but you talk about the polio um, virus. When the pandemic hit, first thoughts, expressions, because someone who's survived and surviving and thriving with polio, what, what were your thoughts or first impressions or anything well, regarding health? Well, um, thank you for asking. That's an interesting question. And um the history of the polio virus and our reaction to it in the United States tells a little story about hum- humanity. Yes. Uh, the first people who, um, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the 1950s, the 1930s, 40s. Please do. Essentially, um, 
when you don't know what's going on, fear throws itself into everything. Mm -hmm. And um, when people were getting, these young children were coming down with this debilitating disease and suddenly couldn't walk or died, mm -hmm. often uh, the it, it affects the muscle, of the ability of the body to use its muscles. And if it attacks those nerves that uh, uh, deal with breath, you're gone. Yeah. So that was... That was the terror of it. Um, and people were suspicious of one another. They weren't sure how it was passed. They didn't know, um, they didn't know anything about mm -hmm. it. Swimming pools were closed. People were isolated in their communities. If you did come down with it, sometimes your whole household would be asked to stay in one place. And... Um, those are some of the things that we started to feel when we were in the midst yeah, of the, the, the coronavirus, recent, the parallels are very interesting. Now, thank you for mentioning the fear. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, continue about where you were. And well, in, 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 a, in an epidemic, which is obviously less, less than a pandemic, which is everywhere, um, the community has to deal with it. And if you're in a very small community, um, you're, you're often asked to send the child to a more a sophisticated place. Sometimes that doesn't happen. What was, what was the treatment for these young children then was an iron lung. And this, this allows them to breathe. Essentially, everybody was concerned about their ability to breathe. Of course. Not so much about their ability to run or whatever was going to happen later. And uh, at that time, uh, someone came up with this great machine which allowed people to... I've seen pictures right, of it. Right. We didn't have a virus. We didn't have a vaccine for the virus, but we did have means to help people get through it, and that was these these crazy machines. Uh, I was put under something. I was, of course, very young, so I don't I don't have a lot of memory of this, but my parents told me. And um, I think the real... The real my, my thoughts went to my parents. Uh, my father was a physician, and he was a very good one and a very... Um, you know, physicians have to have an ego, frankly. They really <laughs> do because they, you know, they're, they've got to help people. And when they can't, it's terrifying and not terrifying. It's just very frustrating. And, I understand because you're trying to do, you're trained, your expertise. Yeah. Why, why can't I figure this out? Mm -hmm. Okay. And if it's your own child, you got oh another problem. God. I can, I can understand. And uh, the other part of this is that um, physicians talk to one another and then the word gets out to the layman. So my dad was getting information that I'm this um, he may not make it, or if he if he does he may be in an institution or institutionalized because he will not be able to help himself. This is the quality of the diagnosis. I had I had bulbar polio, which is uh, I won't go into all that. That's no, I saw where I kind of read yeah. upon where there are different variations yeah. of it. Yes, yeah. sir. So uh, essentially. Um, he tried to tell my mother this, and my mother didn't want to hear it. And she was a very religious woman, and her her solution at my grandmother's was to pray for me, right? And the the story is essentially that uh, you know they 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 persevered while the medical profession, of course, they were working with me. They were the nurses. I have a painting of nurses with a child, and uh, some of the things in my studio or in my shows are related to this. Okay, um, but es essentially. Nurses became my family for a time because I was isolated and taken away from my mother and father. And my mother had this terrible time of not being able to visit me. She's looking at me through a, a glass door at the end of the hallway. You know, oh, and that's pretty hard. Yeah. So these are the thoughts of my, when I started to think about the pandemic, I was thinking about the children and the families and the people who are in a terrible circumstance, not knowing what the what what their, their prognosis is, not knowing what their life's going to be end up being like and that's where we were all of us oh wow um thank you for sharing that um very personal so i read that there was a most recent case in 2022 y yes unfortunately in our in our united states um some some communities have uh, a great fear of vaccines and they did not wish to take the chance on a vaccine for polio and it's not it's not gone it's still in, it's often in countries that are war torn and we've not been able to get medication to places to, that, for access. But it's now back here in the I, United that States. Is, um, that is amazing because at, at, you know, 51, 
we always took our vaccines on a timely basis going through school. You couldn't even get into school if you didn't have them. Mm -hmm. So I, from my history or understanding is that when autism became more of a researched or a hot topic being brought to the forefront, people try to connect autism with vaccines. So you're telling me now, and, and measles, I, I heard of an instance of measles. So I think that hearing that, you know, being so long ago, kind of shocked my system. It's just like, I can't believe that those are now being revived. I've always existed, but more cases of in the United States. So that was very interesting. So um, with the polio society, what efforts does it have in educating people to try to get them to be um, more aware of the necessity of a vaccine like of polio? Well, that's a that probably was in our mandate at some point, um, but um, um, <laughs> I think because we are a we're a dying breed in many respects, the the wave of um, um, baby boomers who had polio has come and gone in many respects. In the 80s, this was a really big deal. There were many, many more people who were alive that had instances of post-polio. Um, the research was being done about, no, little research was being done. So most of our focus, focus was on, as I said, our health care. Uh, we did do, and and Many many polios were, uh, and we refer to ourselves sometimes as polios, but the people with polio were instrumental in lobbying for the ADA, um, Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, because we um, were greatly in need of many of the adaptations to architecture and the work environment because we were willing to work. So that's one instance of us getting out into the world. In the midst of that, we were also, many of the more active, and we have several very strong activists, we're trying to tell the world that, you know, this is, this is what we experienced. And uh, we were saved, many people were saved from this by virtue of the vaccine. And I think also, when you try to assess what your life is like and the, the struggles that you've gone through, you create a story, if you will, or, which is that we're here to tell people that this is a possibility for you. Yes. Um, you know, all of us can have a disability come to us almost overnight Anytime. in many, yeah. many different ways. And uh, um, I know several friends who have told me this, and I'm not the only one who does this, but uh, we, we kind of think that we are an example in the world of what's, um, what's out there. Okay. And, and if people are willing to see this, they will probably make a decision about whether or not they want to go to a, a vaccine or not. And that's, it's a, this is a tough, yeah, it tough, is. tough it, subject because you don't want to put your child in danger. Of course. And so on and so forth. But there we are. That's about all I can say about that. Got one. I, don't, you. I, think... I, I know we're going to tread a very um, thin line here. So I, I want to say that I, I would like to ask, Having experienced this your entire life, when they came up with a vaccine, were you like, of course, I'm going to jump in. I've experienced this um, kind of debilitating disease my entire life. Now that we've got another one, even though they're questioning and it's, um, they're still working out the kinks in it, were you just like, I'm definitely going to, just going to jump in there and get the vaccine? Well, I'm an older man, and uh, my wife actually was one of the first children to um, to test one of the one of the. Um, there's the Salk and the Sabin vaccine variations on that. One was a live virus, which actually had the potential of giving children polio, as opposed to okay a dead virus, and that was the second of these two. Uh, vaccines that were created. My wife was part of the young children who tested early, early on in Cincinnati, the second virus, the one that was dead. Um, so she uh, is a, she, as you ask about this question, has definitely been a crusader for them in some ways. And she was very, very much interested in getting the, the, um, 
uh, COVID-19 vaccine That's as well. That's interesting. I also felt right away that I should do that because I feel, you know, I, I trust medical science. Um, I'm not, I'm, you know, if I'm putting myself in danger, it's, it's, I can't live forever. I understand. I understand. <laughs> so but air on the air. I, it precaution. seemed like the, the smart thing to do. Okay. Uh, and, um, we, we, um, we trust medical science. Let's put it that way. Gotcha. Yeah. Denver, Colorado. What what made you leave Denver? Um, it's such a beautiful place. Why would you possibly, why would you possibly yeah. leave? Well, uh, if you're a performer or an artist there, you have you, in the in the 1970s when I left, there were certain opportunities, but they were limited. Uh, I met some some uh, young singers from. Baltimore at the Peabody Institute, and they were out in Colorado singing in an opera. I happened to get cast in part of that opera. We we shared some stories, and they one young woman said, "Well, you know, there's a lot more going on in Washington D.C., and there's a great teacher out here." Oh, and yeah. da, 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 da. Okay. Would you like to come out? Of course, our relationship ended when I got out here because <laughs> she wasn't expecting really me to. But I did stay. I, you know, I we managed to have a nice um, transition to here. And uh, that was a great opportunity. I'm glad I came. Good, great. So um, any other family still in Denver? No, most of my family has uh, moved on from there. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So your artwork, Any um, anything in the future for 2023 for your work? Oh, or? boy, I don't even think that far away sometimes. <laughs> really? But, uh, I do, I do. But uh, this has been such a nice project and um, having it up now for a year and— um, I'm I'm really focusing on getting people here as much as I can, doing whatever I can to have um, perhaps a, an event or two here to uh, draw people to the to the complex and get them to see that this is a great opportunity, a nice place to have your office. And, awesome. Um, um, so uh, I am thinking ahead, but I'm I there. Those plans are a little less concrete than right now. Uh, I did want to mention that um, my work is uh, for sale, and many of these would make lovely gifts for this coming holiday season. Um, and what else do I have on this card that I'm looking at? Quickly? <laughs> I think that's about it. Okay. And also, we have a, a quite a number of teachers and uh, learning centers associated in the capital workspaces. Mm, okay. I think maybe three. Wow. Um, that's, and you, you're a teacher. Maybe there's a connection there because um, the speech boutique and we have um, another Chloe. Um, I know that expression of art assists in, in anything else in life. Um, math, your ability to learn. And, and kids need a definitely a time to express their emotions and how they're feeling in this time. So that's a possible connection. I really hope that because I, I just absolutely love art. So, um, Well, that's a nice thought. I have taught uh, teaching artists means that essentially you take your your art to a school or you go to a community center and you talk about your art or Yay. you, uh, that's partly why we're here, not just to sell my paintings, but to talk about the process of art and how um, two artists, my wife and I have managed to survive here in our, our great city of Washington, DC. Um, but I do, I do love children. I like to um, like to share my, my, uh, my insights, or if I have anything to share with them, I like to. Be oh, able I'm to sure do that. you absolutely do. Birthing some little Scott Cedars oh. all over the place, new, <laughs> little neo realistic artists. Well, right? that, that would be nice. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's a lovely thing, and uh, fortunately, I've been able to work with several of the uh, cultural institutions, the Kennedy Center and others, Wonderful. going around to our um, elementary schools and talking about them. Awesome. So. Thank Great. you. My pleasure. Awesome. Thanks for Scott, thank you so much for joining us here at The Hub, presented by Capital Workspace. It has been an absolute pleasure. I really want to thank you for educating me on um, polio and your life, um, 
your 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 story of survival. It is very interesting in this new age of viruses and discussing the fear of it and how you didn't let that stand in your way. And I hope that's a message for other people out there that are listening. This will be um, airing very soon. But um, thank you. Um, and this is our first morning podcast. Well, great. <laughs> and um, your art is for sale. You mentioned it. Can you give your website yeah, once again? Yeah, I was just going to suggest that, that uh, you, can, you can see my work at, of course, www.cedar, that's my last name, S-E-D-A-R, thestudio.com. Okay. Uh, so that's Awesome. My... Thank you. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Michelle. Thank okay. you for Andrew for holding all the dials and keeping us... <laughs> Keeping us all together. Gotcha. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you on the next episode of The Hub presented by Capital Workspaces. Until then, have a great day. 